Right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our weekly webinar. We're broadcasting here from a very windy and rainy Cape Town from our new makeshift studio in Newlands, and we're thrilled to kick off yet another insightful webinar session. I'm Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and content-in-chief of Real Estate Investor, South Africa's premier independent real estate news content and education platform since 2007. And today I have the pleasure of serving as your host and moderator for our investment webinar. And at REI, we are immensely passionate about serving the South African real estate investor, the South African real estate and business community through our online digital platform, REI.co.za, our monthly digital magazine, Real Estate Investor, and REI's virtual webinars and our in-person seminars and conferences. And we're really thrilled to have you join us for this very insightful session. And today's topic is unlocking profitable investments in student accommodation in South Africa with our two expert panelists. And before I introduce you to them and delve into our discussion, first a little bit of housekeeping. And I extend a warm invitation to you, our faithful attendees, to actually uh, to actively engage with us during this webinar. Your participation definitely enriches our dialogue. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have for our panelists. And to ask a question, please utilize the designated Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen. That's not the chat box that is reserved for general comments. And rest assured, all of your questions will be addressed during the Q&A panel session in our final session. And recordings of today's webinar will be accessible a post event via email if you've registered for this event. And for those who have not registered for the webinar, recordings are available on the rei.co.za website under events on the homepage. So let's move into the heart of today's webinar, Unlocking Profitable Investments in Student Accommodation in South Africa. And today we'll gain valuable strategies, industry trends, and first-hand experiences to optimize your investment potential into this very lucrative sector. And we have the specialist to guide us and to guide you getting started and also to be profitable if you're not already there. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to our esteemed guest panelists today. First of all, we've got Donna Bunzaya. He's the winner of the 2019 Investor of the Year Awards. He's a physiotherapist by profession from Bloemfontein, a student accommodation investor, and so welcome to you, Donna. And uh, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, Neil. Thank you that I can be here today. Hi, attendees. What a great opportunity it is for me to be here with you guys and to able share a little bit of, of my insight into student accommodation. I really feel that student accommodation is a very lively market with lots of potential and with lots of profit. I really hope that you guys get what you need from this session today. Thanks, guys. Great stuff. Great, wonderful having you. Uh, our second panelist, uh, she is running a little bit late and she will join us a little bit later. It's Rita van Rooyen. Um, just so that you know, Rita, she's the founder and CEO of My Student House. It's a student accommodation business that specializes in student accommodation, property management and student management in dealing also with NASFAS and all kinds of management uh, with uh, properties. So, which is quite a complex thing to do. So Rita is also an author of the book, Creating Wealth in Student Accommodation in South Africa. So we will get, uh, let her join us a little bit later. And so, but I think let's let's get straight into the event. I know we've got uh, lots of people here today. So I also encourage you, please to engage and ask lots of questions and uh, it's your opportunity. So let's just look a little bit at the market overview, um, Donna. Maybe just give us just a little bit of a view, just an overall view of what the current state of the student accommodation market is in South Africa. Maybe you can, you know, and I know for you, you're based specifically in Bloemfontein and it has obviously their own trends within Bloom. Um, but maybe just talk a little bit about sort of you know, any emerging trends or shifts or anything in demand that sort of investors should be aware of? In other words, the whole market, how, how, do, how does that look? All right, Neil, with regards to student accommodation, 
A person has to realize that there's currently a shortage of around 500,000 beds for tertiary education attendees in our country. <clears throat> and to put this into more, more perspective, in 2016, when Bladen Zamande was our Minister of Higher Education, it was said that by 2030, they'd like 3 million students on our tertiary campuses. I had a look at, at the stats this morning. Currently, we have about 1.6 million students on our tertiary campuses. So in the next five years and a little bit of change, they would like to grow that number by 1.4 million. Without having to say anything more, you can think for yourself, if we already have a shortage of 500,000, that shortage is going to be dramatically bigger. And what, what's also quite interesting for me is that of the 1.6 million students on tertiary campuses, 1.3 of them, in other words, 80% of our students are NISFAS bursary holders. And for that reason, I feel that a person would be absolutely stupid if you want to cut off that market and only aim at private students. I'm not saying don't do private students, but I think you, want to, you don't necessarily want to go in and cut off 80% of your market. And if you do it correctly, the way I am, you can definitely make a profit. Student accommodation is profitable if done right. And I'm sure Rhea will also add her thoughts about this during the session. And I'm certain she also agrees with me regarding this. Great stuff. Thanks very much for that, uh, Donna, and a nice little intro. Rita, you can switch on your cam. I know you've, you've run a, a little bit late this morning, so you can actually do your introduction. Rita, I see you You definitely are. There we go. We got Rita. Yeah. <laughs> so Rita, you missed the little introduction, and, and obviously I, I gave the whole spiel of where you come from and that kind of stuff. So maybe you can restart that just to... And then before we get into sort of questioning and maybe you just telling us a little bit about the overview of the student accommodation market in South Africa right now. I mean, after all, you're the author of a book. So uh, so certainly maybe you can you can share that with the audience. So first introduce yourself and then obviously tell us about you know, what the emerging trends are in the student accommodation sector. Um, yeah, so um, as, uh, as Neil said, I've... Um, I'm the CEO of a company called My Student House, and we do a student, um, we're like a rental agency for student accommodation. We only focus on students. Um, and we, so we play in detail with students, with the universities, with NASFAS. We are across the board uh, in like four different provinces, and we have about 1,500 students that we manage. And we have been intimately involved with this whole new NASFIS pilot um, that I don't know if everybody knows about that, but for us, that has kind of been our biggest um, challenge and opportunity in the, in the same breath almost that, that we've experienced this year. Um, we still, half of the students are still with the old model, half of them are with the new model. And we have managed to also get uh, involved on the NSFIS task team that they are running to make the pilot better and solve all the issues and problems um, that people have experienced this year. Uh, so that I think has been has been quite a, a big a big focus and what's happening in the market and it, it's really causing huge problems in some areas, but it's also solving problems with the TVET colleges and and so on that that we've seen. Um, yeah, so it's it's exciting times, it's difficult times, it's complicated, but we just have to to work through it and and kind of roll with the punches and and make things work. And and that is what we have been doing um, for our landlords this year. So I think it's also a very important point you've raised there, Rita, because I think what everybody has to realize is that the the market obviously changes all the time. Um, there's these 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 dynamics, these new challenges, these these new opportunities, and 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 then somebody decides to shift the goalposts completely. <laughs> and I think this is what we 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 got to realize as investors. It's it's not a passive sort of thing that you're getting involved in, and specifically for student accommodation, they're highly specialized, very different, and while very lucrative, we've got two experts like yourself to share it and to tell it really as it is. 
So Donna, then let's get into the next question, and 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 maybe maybe you tell us from an investment potential, what are primary reasons investors should consider student accommodation as an investment opportunity in South Africa? So maybe and then maybe just elaborate. You know, how does student accommodation compare to other types of property investment in terms of ROI and stabil and stability? And I'm also going to ask you exactly the same question, Rita, after after Donna has given, and maybe you can just add on after that. Neil, um, you and I were talking yesterday. I think with any investment, the most important thing is firstly the price at which you acquire your your property. <clears throat> so, if I was looking to get involved into student accommodation, I'd definitely start looking for property which is priced correctly. But more importantly is that you have property located within the vicinity of a tertiary education institution. It doesn't help you are far away. And especially if you are looking at, at affordable student accommodation, aiming at NISFA students, you want to be ideally within walking distance of the campus. And what I've found is that you want to be a step ahead of your competitors. You want to add a little bit more than what they are. I know that there are certain standards, but things according to the norms and standards which are available and which are required by NISFAS, but you want to add a little bit more to make it more lucrative. I example, yes, I have Wi-Fi, I have electricity, I have water, but I also have a lot of other things like armed response and so on for my, for my accommodation which I provide. With regards to returns, I honestly have infinite returns on some of my properties where I don't have a single cent of my own money in the property which I've acquired, but I'm making a healthy return where I'm getting maybe between 10 and 12,000 Rand a month clear over 12 months. And I, I, I want to very specifically say 12 months because we must realize that students are in your accommodation for mostly 10 months in a year. So I only pay rental for 10 months, but I try and calculate my returns and my cash flow over a 12-month period because you still need to pay those expenses that are still there in the months that your students are not there. I really do feel that student accommodation is one of, if not the, most lucrative and most profitable um, investments that, that there are. Yes, there might be a high barrier to entry with regards to all the requirements, but I really do think that's very, very lucrative. You muted? Wonderful. No, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Donna. Thank you. <laughs> I saw Rita, she's struggling a little bit there with uh, your background. Rita's not an issue. I think the most important thing is we need to see you first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know some, some of the technologies, we are sometimes te technologically challenged on that, but but not an issue. We can see you now, which is great. So let's just 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 elaborate a, a little bit of what, what Donna has given. He's given some really good points there in terms of the investment potential for uh, student accommodation and how it compares to other types of investments. So you know, I think Donna did say a lot of a lot of important things. Um, in my experience, I found that the closer you are to a university or a, a institution, the more expensive your properties become because those landlords know, you know, it's common knowledge on on the internet and everywhere. Oh, NASA pays five thousand a month or, or whatever it is for um, for the uh, for students. So they do the numbers and the agents advise them and, and they overcharge for their properties. So um, it's also, you can also look at um, bus routes, public transport, that sort of thing. And then as a landlord, you can offer a subsidy for transport for a student to university. Um, you know, yes, you're going to make a little bit less, but your property and the amount you paid for the property will be a lot lower. So you can do the numbers and, and see if that works for you uh, and if, if that uh, still makes sense on, on your investment. And that way you can really tap into, into a whole different set of properties where people don't even know about students yet and you can pick up really good bargains. 
The other thing is also um, what I think uh, works is a big opportunity right now in the space um, is the, the TVET colleges. In the past, um, it was hard. I didn't really take any of the TVET college students into my properties because the amounts they got for accommodation was very, very low before. Now, NASWIS has standardized that amount across property, uh, across all, all the, if you're a student, that's what that's what you get. Yes, metros, non-metros, there's a difference, but in general, everybody gets the same. And NASWIS is going to pay the landlords directly. So you don't have this problem anymore where even though they, they got a lot less, they also pay the students and not the landlords. So right now we are already for the uh, TV colleges that are on this NASPIS pilot that's busy busy happening. We have been getting payments directly from NASPIS and the same amount, so we know it's true. Uh, and that's what, we, what we've been getting. And those TV colleges are very, very underserved. They're also situated in areas which could be in rural areas, in very remote places and that sort of thing. And those students have traditionally all been staying at back rooms, um, sometimes not really good conditions. The standards weren't there. Uh, I know in Cape Town, they've, they've overcrowded those students in, in buildings. So there for me is, is a huge, huge opportunity um, that anybody can look at if you're close to a, a TVET, you know, get your pro understand the accreditation, get your property on the NASFA system, and, you know, you can help those students with some accommodation. So for me, that is, is a huge, huge opportunity that I don't know how many people know about it or, or they understand, um, but we have taken on so many more TVET students this year. Like, I think and we're just being flooded by inquiries from, from these TVET students that are now just so happy to have other opportunities and and so on to to live in in proper proper accommodation spaces so yeah um and i think the rest is all kind of um you know just general property type of um investment opportunities but for me those are the the biggest ones that i i see right now all right i think you said that's it very well so let's talk a little bit about the regulatory environment and obviously you alluded to it a little bit earlier on as well, Rita, but uh, we're going to start off with you, Donna, because obviously NASFAS and all the different, uh, the new and the old model you referred to earlier on, uh, um, uh, Rita, but I think let's talk about what are the key regulations or legal considerations that investors should be mindful of when investing in student accommodation? Because it's, it's not just as straightforward as, you know, a buy to let kind of environment. You mentioned that the, the services as well, Rita, and, and that kind of thing. So maybe just, just just tell us, Donna, from your perspective, what are those key legal considerations and regulations that you're going to be aware of when in, in your sector? Specifically with regards to, again, Bloemfontein, we've had a lot of pushback from the residents in certain neighbourhoods. So you want to ensure that, firstly, your property has been legalized. You either have special consent or you have to have the correct zoning for your property to ensure that you are allowed to house students. <clears throat> then with regards to what you have to provide, um, the national norms and standards for housing at uh, universities is available on, on the web internet. And that will guide a lot of people with regards to what is specifically required from your property. And the ratios of students to bathrooms, students to kitchens, how many people are allowed. And those will definitely ensure that you, firstly, are in line, but secondly, that NISFAS will be able to credit you to ensure that you get payment. And in the end, that's what you want. You want to have your money. Thanks, Neil. Okay, awesome. So, so Rita, I'm just going to, you, you alluded to this whole NSF, the NASFAS environment and what's actually happening. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more because you, you started on this new and old model and that kind of thing. But also just talk about the regulatory environment in general to what Donna was also mentioning. Yeah. The regulations that you, that you have to adhere to. So there's the part which is around um, 
if you want uh, NS for students, then there's the national norms and standards that that Donna spoke about. So, and that's that's fairly simple because it's it's all documented and so on. And that is around your property, your furniture, your room sizes, your bathrooms ratios, and so on. Um, and that's it's easy to find. You Google it, and it's there. The part that we we kind of tripped up on when we went through the the whole accreditation with Enisfis is that there's a one liner in that regulations that says, oh by the way, you have to conform to health and safety uh, the health and safety standards act or whatever it is. And um, you know we didn't deep dive into that one <laughs> as much as you know you need fire equipment you need this and that. Um, there's a whole set of extra extra things that they look for uh, with your accreditation. Assembly points, there's um, fire at certain places that they want, the, your your fire detection, your smoke detection systems, um, these evacuation plans. And, and yes, all of those things are, are standard, but it, it, it doesn't always cross your mind. So as much as we had our our health and safety things implemented, there were still gaps that they specifically were looking for, um, which I am going to be making a video about, uh, which is the checklist of all of those things, um, which will be on my YouTube channel. But in the meantime, that that was one of it. So it's the health and safety, it's your norms and standards for the students and furniture. And then there's also, um, the, th the other one is around your your municipality. Okay, how do you keep the neighbors happy, the municipality happy, and that regulatory environment, which can be very, very tricky, and you really need like a town planning expert to to help you through that. Every town is different, as much as you know, NASA's will say, Oh, you need a zoning certificate, but what must be on it? <laughs> okay, because you need consent in Bloemfontein, you know, you need consent um on a res one, but in other in other municipalities, sorry, that's not good enough. You need a boarding house uh, consent to be on there. Um, or so every municipality is different, and that's why you need a local town planner to just guide you through that. Um, and they can check also in the area. Or that is everybody just old people that live there that has never done any changes on their houses. Then good luck for you to try and change your zoning. Okay, it's going to be hard. But if if these different zonings in the neighborhood, there's been a trend established um, and the municipality can't then deny you if they approved someone else, then you know, okay, great, I have a chance to to be able to change these the zoning. Or if you're lucky, maybe it, it is zoned correctly already. So those are the the kind of regulatory things that that you have to look at. Um, because NASFAS for your accreditation, they do ask for all of that, all of those those documents. Um, so it's important to buy right and to know that you are compliant like that as well. Wonderful. I think uh, I think what everybody should know out here today is that Rita has written a book. It's called Creating Wealth in Student Accommodation in South Africa. And I really encourage you to read that book. And uh, in fact, Rita had it on her virtual background, which unfortunately we couldn't put it up now, but not a problem. Uh, we will put a link out there uh, for you to purchase the book. It is a wonderful read if you want to get in and all the things we're talking about is in that particular uh, book as well. And uh, and also, I think I must add is that in, in mid-September, um, Rita also trains people and runs courses, both online and live courses, if you want to get into student accommodation, she will be running one in mid-September. So you can reach out for us if you want to, to get into that as well. Donna himself is was Investor of the Year in, in 2019. He was the annual Investor of the Year, and particularly for his student accommodation strategy. So Donna, I'm going to come to you now with regards to location strategy. Now, of course, you're based in Bloemfontein. And it probably makes sense to 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 become really a superstar out in, in Bloemfontein first before you sort of expand outside, which I'm sure you you are going to look at at some stage. So maybe just tell us, and 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 once again, Rita, you you alluded to it because you're more of a national operation. So we're going to hear from you as well. But Donna, so what are the key factors to consider when selecting a location for student accommodation investment? Are there specific regions or cities within South Africa that are more favorable 
for such investments. Now, you're going to talk, obviously, from a Bloom perspective, and you've got very much intimate knowledge of what's going on in Bloom. So maybe we'll start with you. All right, Neil. As I said earlier, what you ideally want is to have a property within a radius of, at most, according to me, a kilometer from your tertiary institution. What I also found, though, is that what's very helpful, and alluding to what Rieta said earlier regarding your zoning and your special consent, is that I took the, the Spluma plan, which the, the municipality has, for further development for Bloemfontein. And I aimed at buying properties in the areas which they have earmarked for higher density development. And that definitely makes that you don't struggle as much as what you would buying property, maybe just out of that in another area with your special consent or your zoning application, as Red also said earlier. Um, the other thing is you want to have areas, as Red also said, close to bus routes and so on, if you are not within a walking distance of your university or your, tech, or your technicon. These would be ideal locations, as, according to my knowledge. Thanks. Okay. So, Rieta, you on a slightly different sort of angle. Um, you 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 sort of playing in in the national market, and, and you you played in most areas. Tell us a little about what are those key factors to consider, and you know what are the specific regions or cities because, and I think a lot through through your courses and stuff, you've managed to motivate a lot of people to start investing themselves. And uh, and also to become so they started to 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 look in the market and start inspect the, uh, look at the deals out there. So maybe if you can share that with us. Yeah. So if I look at the the different towns, obviously you it, wherever there's a major university, you will also find TV colleges. So uh, you can almost look at that, and and then you'll know that there will be a very very strong demand. So it's it's. First of all, I look at where's the demand. It's pointless buying something that's 20 kilometers away from a university and maybe there's just one TVET college 20 kilometers away. You, you're not going to fill your place. It's going to be hard. NASFIS, in the new pilot, they do allow five kilometers from the institution. If, it, if you buy something that's further away than five kilometers, you as a landlord have to provide transport for the students. And that could then become very, very expensive. So definitely a five kilometer rate. I, I agree one hundred percent with Donna. The closer you are, the better, right? Because that is is more appealing for students. But in terms of the regulations, the five kilometer is what you're looking at for for your um, for this this new accreditation pilot uh, pilot that's happening. Um, and then in terms of towns, then. You know, you, you can kind of look at where's your demand strong for students and the more institutions, private, as well as um, universities, major universities, TVETs, where, where you have more kind of clustered together and that you can easily check on Google Maps, right? You That is sort of where, where you can safely go and, and buy something now. The less places they are, the weaker your, your demand is going to be. And then the second thing is to check with your competition, okay? How many places are around? Are they flats? Is it just expensive places like, you know, I don't want to name names, now, but these black people that like 18,000. So there's huge top ups for NASFA students. So who's your competition? Is it maybe just a whole lot of small houses and that's not at a, at a very good standard? You know, then then you know where you can put. And how do you, how do you know this? Hello. You either have a child that can go and check it out for you, or you're you're old enough to be a parent of a child and you can go and check it out again. <laughs> so, so you have no excuse to go and check out your competition. Um, you know, and and then you'll you you you'll be able to to do that. Different towns, the opportunities there um, with the different universities is closing down now because it's going to be a standard, right? So yes, great, Poch Pay is fantastic, but next year it's NASFA Spain, so. That doesn't really um, matter anymore. And then you can then check and say your safety concerns and you know the the buildings in the area. Is it are you in a in a town? Um, you is it safe for the students to be there? And then the property prices of that town obviously makes a big difference. 
Like I, I can't believe how cheap property at the moment um, still is in PE. Um, and then other places like Stellenbosch, UCT, you're going to pay a lot of money. So will that NASFAS cap rate work for you? That's obviously, yeah. you must make money, right? This is an investment. So that, that NASFAS cap, will it work for your property price is the, is the next best thing. And that is very different for each town that you, that you might go to. Um, so you can assess that. Uh, and obviously try and buy something, especially if it's your first one, that's closer to where you are so that you can learn and you can step in and, you know, you don't have to, maybe you might go, have to go there every single day for the, for the first few months, especially during intake. So make sure it's close enough to where you are so that you can get involved and you, and you can do what needs to be done um, as a, as a first time investor while you learn. Sorry, I said a lot. Sometimes no, I say too much. But, you, but you, you must. No, no, I think it's very important, Greta, because I think uh, you've got a national sort of helicopter view. You've operated in, I mean, you're sitting in, in Cape Town, in the Western Cape. And uh, so that's your stronghold, of course. And I remember last year we did a whole bus tour. We went to go look at all your your locations and that kind of stuff in, in Cape Town. But you're also operating in in Potch, you operating, you did operate in Johannesburg, uh, and, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. You also operating in the Pretoria area. I'm not sure whether you're in Donna's background, but I know that uh, you, you you sort of are there. Certainly, Port Elizabeth or Kuberg, as uh, you mentioned, uh, which is very lucrative from a pricing, and I was there actually with you, so I could actually say, well, wow, look at some of those deals there. Uh, some of the properties are really priced very nicely big opportunities but you know it's not just about the property it's also being able to deliver on the strategy so i think it's all critical i think it's all very important in the context of what you've shared um and obviously anybody who's considering to move in a specific area you've got to really get to understand that area and you mentioned it right at the end being profitable so now we're going to move on to property management and i know this is a lot of your specialization Rita, but donna we're going to ask you now. So, because what are the challenges and the best practices associated with managing student accommodation properties in South Africa? And also, you know, it's slightly different from, you know, your normal buy to lets, which, uh, you know, you, you know, we've got NASFAS who's paying you, as you mentioned, and in some cases you've got students who are paying you directly, you know. So how can investors mitigate risks associated with tenant turnover and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. And I know you both alluded to it a little bit, but let's let's go a little bit more deep dive into it, starting with you, Donna. Thanks, Neil. Um, my personal opinion is that for me, where I have a profession which I'm still working in, I've got to be... And you're allowed to say what it is. You're allowed to say what you are. No, no I'm a physiotherapist <laughs> and I work in the hospitals. Um, I can't be there hands-on every day. So I need someone who's doing it on my behalf. The other thing is, if I have someone that does it on my behalf where I'm not so hands-on, it's a lot more scalable and making it possible for me to acquire more properties. What was very important for me, as I said last, I got involved in property in 2008 already. I had a lot of time in property making enough mistakes and coming across enough managing agents to know that you need someone who specializes in student accommodation, who knows the market, who has connections at the different tertiary institutions, being able to ensure that you get accredited and get your stuff running smoothly. The other thing is you, you need an agent, except for the connections that they might have, as I've just alluded to, they also need access to a market. If you don't have access to a market, I know of colleagues of mine who've got involved in student accommodation and they come running to me in March and almost the intake is too late, is passed. They don't have students. They need people to fill their houses because they're trying to manage it by themselves, totally inexperienced, not knowing what happens. So in my personal opinion, experience with a managing agent who specializes in the field and knows what they're dealing with is of utmost importance. And word of mouth, speak to investors around you who are already in student accommodation to get the names and get access 
to these agents is what I would suggest. Wonderful. Now, I think, Rita, this is like music to your ears because you, on the one hand, you actually got your own portfolio properties, which you obviously manage yourself and you've managed to become a really good, competent property manager in student accommodation. And you mentioned right at the outset, you said, well, the action is there by Tivit, your co colleges, and you also mentioned the whole NASVAS thing, which is now becoming really complicated. And there are some investors there that just want to look at that and just run. And you've decided, and which you do already, for a number of other student accommodation property landlords, you manage that. You do that process on behalf of them besides your own. So maybe you talk about, you're probably the right person on this one, but not to say that Donna, Donna has achieved some great stuff, but what are those challenges and best practices associated with managing student accommodation? And I know there's a lot. <laughs> uh, it, it, and th this was, for the people out there, this was not planned at all, okay? <laughs> when, when I heard Donna saying that, I'm like, yes, please, this is what I keep telling people. <laughs> So that was that was really cool to hear, and um, you know. So, but now coming from the my my management hat on, for me it's rules, 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 and discipline. That is the key thing with students. Um, without rules and and without creating that discipline, you know, you can't have the the good and the fun things with students as well that that we do. Um, so. Everybody needs to, we, we're working and we, we're dealing with shared spaces. You know, if you make a noise, somebody else is trying to study, it very quickly escalates to students leaving your property because of people that party too much. Um, and, and these are young people that might be out of their family homes for the first time. I remember how I was as a first year flip. I just wanted to party every single day, okay? So I was probably the worst, people's worst nightmare. Um, and and so for me, the getting the rules right, setting your disciplinary process in place, and then following through consistently, it almost feels like now, you know, as a parent, you 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 you're preaching to parents like that as well. That's what parents should do with their kids. Um, I'm not so great with my kids, but with the students, we have a very set procedure and and um, uh, rules that we enact right from the beginning when when they move in. From there, you know, your, your cleaning becomes much easier, your uh, maintenance, because now your, your processes that you put in place, the systems and tools that you use, maintenance is a very big one. Students are very actually patient, right? They will complain about something for a long time, but once they have had enough, good luck for you, they're going to break your place on purpose, okay? So it's important for them to uh, to to have for you to have the tools available to help you. Now you might think I only have one house, well, okay, but you have twenty people in there, so you actually have twenty rental units in effect, okay? That you have clients that you have to keep happy, and by the way, they also have parents, right? So that's at least another twenty. So that becomes forty people that you have to keep happy by just having one house. So if there's no water in that house. How many people are going to call you and complain about the water not being on? Okay, and it's not me; it's council. Um, so having the tools, the communication, the the bulk communication and tools available to assist you with that is really, really critical. And especially if you want to scale and you want to grow. And believe me, after you've had your first property and you got in that money, you want another one. Okay, <laughs> so you definitely need those those the systems, the tools the processes and the discipline. And if you have that in place, then everything else really, it falls it falls into place. And, and Donna was talking about the connections as well. A lot of times, I mean, our, us being on that NASFIS panel this year has really been invaluable to me. Uh, so much information that we're getting from, from NASFIS directly now, we, we can influence and we can say, what direction things are going to go, what the cap is going to be next year. We actually on that, um, they call it a commission. We, we actually represented on in that, in that commission. So we, we know now what, what's going on and what's happening and we can plan accordingly. So the connections, the, the, the student discipline to get the students in place and then to, to keep your, your clients, your students happy with proper processes, systems and so on to, to keep your maintenance under control. 
yeah, it, it, it sounds like three simple things, but it's actually <laughs> quite a, a mission to, to, um, you know, to, to have that ready. And that's why I started the management company because I couldn't find a rental agent that could manage my properties for me. Like I wanted it to be managed. Um, so, you know, if you can't find someone, then you have to do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I must reach out to you then, Greta, uh, on you know, that one. And I think, you know, property management is not for all landlords. And it doesn't matter in which sector you're operating in, whether it's student accommodation, whether it's buy to let, uh, or whether it's commercial, whatever it may be, um, there are different nuances. And some landlords prefer to outsource that function. So I think it's a very important point there. Let's 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 move on to sort of financial feasibility, and it's related to property management. It's related to co collections. It's related to tenant profile, specifically from a student tenant perspective. But maybe let's talk about you know what are the typical financial metrics and benchmarks investors should use to assess the feasibility of student accommodation. I mean, are there any specific models, financial models, or strategies? that are particularly effective. And you know what I mean? It's all about the collection, the rent collection, you know, you know, how can you tailor this to to attract and but most importantly collect? And you mentioned NASFAS, some are getting directly from NASFAS, et cetera. So maybe starting with you, Dana, just that financial feasibility and in terms of tenants and, and collecting and that kind of thing. Donna, I think Donna is, is it's a, I don't know whether it's on my side, but certainly I think Donna is frozen. Is that so? Oh, Donna, you're unfrozen now. Did you get my no, I'm unfrozen, yeah. <laughs> no, you broke up there. I didn't hear the No, that's fine. Question. No, not a problem. Not a problem because I, I would have thought that that would have been the case. So in terms of financial feasibility, what are the typical financial metrics and benchmarks investors should use to assess the feasibility of a student accommodation in investment are there any specific models financial models or strategies that are particularly effective and we're talking particularly about in terms of collecting as well what makes it vi viable is the collections and some are collecting directly from NASFAS themselves some are collecting from the parents uh, of the students etc so maybe just just elaborate a little bit on that all right I want to make a disclaimer that all my tenants on this was virtual so I'll can Turk from, speak from that point of view. Um, I've read Reta's book, funny enough. I got one of the first ones and I finished reading it very quickly. Reta alludes in the book that you roughly want 10 students to every million rand which you pay for property. At that stage, that was quite accurate. I haven't gone as deeply into if that still is the case exactly anymore, but I reckon it will be very close to that. With regards to the money that we get, we are not on the national pilot as Reta is. We are still being paid by the tertiary institution, but we get paid directly. So you, there's no, if I have 10 students that are in this first birth holders, my invoice is sent to the tertiary institution and on payday, I get paid my 10 students money in full. Um, so there's no chasing of money as there was with private students. With private payments. Um, with regards to other financial models, you want to sit and work out and calculate exactly what your income is, what your expenses are to determine your net operating income. And once you have your net operating income, you have a good idea of what your goal is, what your um, bond payment should be of your net operating income. And that will give you a better idea as to the financial feasibility of an investment. Um, as I said earlier, if you do it correctly, you could end up having a infinite return, which I do see regularly. Okay, but well, that's great. So, Rita, you elaborate on that. I'm not going to. I mean, you heard the question up front. Maybe uh, I know you also got viewpoints on that. You're just breaking up there, Rita. I don't know why. What you, you we heard it, heard you just for a second, and then you you sort of faded out. <laughs> okay, you just, just went out there a little bit, Rita. I'm not sure what happened in terms of your sound. 
we can hear you now. Wait, no, we can't. <laughs> um, so Richard, okay, now can we can hear now? you. Oh, okay, yes, perfect. <laughs> okay, cool. There we go. All right. <laughs> um, on. I think Donna, you know, he mentioned like I always say, my magic number is ten to a million. That was back in 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 twenty twenty one, and right now because rentals went up over in in this period, um, a, a eight to a million can also work. Um, however, right now, if I get 10 to a million, I'm, as long as the location is fine, you know, I don't even need to go and view the place. I'm like, just send me the offer. <laughs> Where do I sign? Because that's, that is definitely, then you'll, you'll get great, great numbers. And no matter what your expenses is, is obviously you have to control your water and electricity, but everything else kind of, um, works out like that. If it's eight to a million then I need to fine tune and I need to be 100% correct about everything else that, that is there. Um, when I plan my furniture requirements up to the NASPA standards, you can, I, I generally use about, and after inflation and all of that, um, I use about 8,500 per student. Okay, that's just a rough estimate benchmark. It then depends on, you know, how many your bulk payment prices, where do you shop, all of those things. But I, I generally in my numbers, I'll put like a, a eight and a half. Um, and then the other very, very important thing is when you start off, chances are, and especially with this disruption that's happening now with this pilot, you almost need, you need to know what your expenses are going to be for, for the students um, per month. And then Try and have six months of expenses saved up somewhere. It's a lot. It's a lot of money, but it it will just save yourself so much stress in this process. If you can have that, why do I say six months? Because if you're gonna buy and say your property transfers in, it can't really transfer later than November December because you might you need to get furniture, you need to advertise and market the place. Um, so there's a lot of activities you might want to convert or or build some more rooms if you have approval for that. So these things that you need, that you need to do. So let's say in in November the property transfer. So you need for your bond and whatever other expenses, you need November, December, January, February, March, and April. The first time we saw money from NASFAS this year was May. So that's six full months of cash that you need. Because you can't in in February or March when the students move in, all of a sudden you have those those higher water and electricity charges that you now need to pay. You can't not pay it. You can't not pay the Wi-Fi because then all your students are out and there goes your money. Because if you do not fill the property during intake by March, you empty for the rest of the year. That's a year's worth of money down the tubes. So you so and your accreditation, if the students go and complain, your accreditation will be revoked, which makes it even worse, you know. Um so very important to to have that that cash at hand um and, and be ready for that. And you know, I um and then I always say to people in the first year, don't even if you have profit, don't take it. Okay. <laughs> Just leave it, leave it there, put it in a savings account, put it somewhere. And then the following year, you have your buffer of six months. And then after that, you can take whatever profits you want in the property. Or you can grow and add more, whatever you want to do with it. But I've seen so many landlords fail because they don't build up that buffer for that dry period. And, um, you know, and, and that is some of the biggest reasons why landlords fail, Um it's is been not being able to to manage their cash flow properly because life happens. You have crises and then you have all this money in in your account. People dip into that, and that's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen landlords make. Well, I think that's such a critical point that you make there, Rieta, because cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. That it's all about. Don't touch that money. I think you brought up some critically important points. Uh, if you're going to collect, keep it there. Six months buffer, very, very, very important points. 
and uh, instead of playing around the money or going on a holiday or do, putting or spending it out on something else and i see we had a little snigger there from donna don't do that you know so which is <laughs> so let's talk let's deal we've got a few questions yeah um and uh, you, you can opt i think both of you can have a crack at this the first one is what are the new technologies that are being employed in the student accommodation sector? And I know Ruth, you certainly using a, a property management tool. Donna, I'm not sure what you're using, but maybe just in terms of new technologies, um, what, what what are the ones that have been employed currently in that sector? Starting with you, Donna, and then of course you, Ruth. I think with regards to management, Ruth might be the better one to answer regarding this. If she doesn't okay. mind. No, that's cool. I think she, she, she'll be quite happy to do that. <laughs> okay, so, you know, when you're doing student accommodation, you, you, you're managing a business. Um, so I'm just going to, on a very high level, touch on, on some of the, the, the technologies and tools that, that we use. Um, I think in about two weeks, I, I have a video scheduled on the YouTube channel that's going to deep dive a little bit more into them. So you can just go there and notify when it releases. Um, but the, so from a business point of view, you need to, you need to obviously understand your, your financials so that you can present that to a bank. For that, we use a very, very simple cloud tool called, uh, Xero for accounting and all accountants should, should know about that. Um, but you as a, as an individual landlord can fairly easily, if you know how to click and load a bank account, you can, if you know how to do your personal, uh, budget, you, you, you can use that tool. The other one that we use for management specifically is, and I, I went through, I went through a lot of things that cost me a lot of money, um, and the one that we're on right now that I'm quite happy with is uh, called uh, Modus Ten. Uh, it is a they they will white label it for you. You can put your own branding on it, and um, you know this this company then runs the the software for you, and you pay a license fee for that. For, for communication with students, um, because remember, yes, I'm filling a thousand beds, but I'm getting to fill a thousand beds, I'm getting 10, 15,000 inquiries. Um, and to be able to manage that, those volumes, we use a CRM system called HubSpot, um, which helps with that. And it combines all your, your incoming channels. And, um, and if you use it right, it can be free, actually, which is also very cool. I like free stuff. Um, so, so those are the, and then of course, advertisement is on all your, your social channels and we use some influences and so on as well. But yeah, that I think in a nutshell is, is the, all the tools and technologies that, that we use. They still buy metrics and other things as well on the properties, but yeah, that's basically it. No, nice. I think, thank you very much for that. I think very important. Next question, is there a place where we can find the tertiary institutions that NASFAS are funding in the country and how much students get for accommodation in the different areas? Do you want to have a crack at that? Um, I, I think, Neil, uh, uh, so it's actually, it's actually very... Or can you hear me? <laughs> Am I back? Okay. Back, you're back, cool. So, so I I would say that the answer is very simple. Any public TVET college and any public university is funded by NASVIS. Any private college is not not funded. So, Edivas, um, Stadio, those are all private institutions, and you can just Google their names. And and they won't fund us for students to study there. So only the public universities and colleges. Okay, great. I think that's uh, that definitely gives an idea. Then can your guest share average rental income per student, private and NASVAS? Who wants to have a crack at that? You're giving away your your IP here. <laughs> All right. Seeing as though, as I said, most of my students are NASVAS students. I know that in the bigger metros, the in, the income is capped at five thousand rand. Here in Bloemfontein, it's close to three thousand eight hundred rand that we are capped at. And what we have found is that the students, if they pay full price, they they'd like a single room, and then your sharing rooms end up being cheaper. So 
more or less for Bloemfontein, not being a full metro as Johannesburg or Cape Town or Durban, we are capped at about 3,800, 3,900 rand. And then Rieta, the bigger metros are capped at 5,000 rand, if I'm not mistaken. Can you elaborate just a little bit on those returns? Um, because there's a question around explain your infinite returns or how one can achieve this. Returns on... Great? Yeah, ROIs, yeah. I think it all depends on how much money you want to put into the property um, going ahead at buying. As I said earlier, if you do it correctly, you don't have to put any money in. Rieta said earlier where she she also budgets for the amount of furniture. And I totally agree, you roughly seven to eight and a half thousand rand per student for the furniture. And if you do it correctly, you can even use the money that you get out of your bond to pay for that. As I said, I started off in student accommodation getting returns of around 20%. That was my, my mark. If I didn't get 20%, I, I wouldn't buy. And then my education improved to where I don't have to use any money of my own to acquire a property. So you have infinite returns. So it all depends, I think, on your education and your level of skill that you have. And what I'd suggest is that get a coach or get reading to learn more about this to help on how to do it. Wonderful. So Rita, you got the book, you got the coaching, you got all that stuff. Yeah. So maybe but but tell us your numbers. <laughs> so I sorry, I, I need to because this income situation is a joke right now. So <laughs> So they communicate 5,000, but I, I did a YouTube video, like a 25 minutes, just like explaining about this because it's it's now with the pilot, it's linked to your grading as well. And then it depends on whether you're in a metro or a non-metro. And then it depends on the type of rooms you have. And, you know, all of that kind of mixes in. So it can be anything the most, and then there's fees. So the university has fees that they deduct. NASFIS has fees that they deduct for you to be on their portal. So you think, oh, great, you have 5,000, but you're not actually getting that, okay? So it, it becomes very tricky. The most we've seen is like, four th oh, and then people are in the pilot, then they're out of the pilot. Then they appeal with NASFIS and then they get more. And then oh, it, it, is, it is really, this year is, is really, it's a mess. So I think, um, the most we've seen is 4,750. That's for a graded property um, in a metro. Non-metros gets 41,000. That's the max that, that you're going to get. Um, on, on the A grade, uh, on the if you're on the pilot. So, and then a sharing room is less. That comes to 4,513 rands or something like that on an A grade uh, metro property. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole big table that they that they've released um, with with all of these rates on it. But yeah, right now I'm just happy to get any kind of money because and who's going to pay it? I don't even know anymore. But I'm just happy to get something in the bank. Wonderful, no, great. I think it's uh, thank you for your honesty there, Rita, just telling it like it is. Because yeah, they are challenges, but we got to work through them. Guys, I can't believe it. where's the time gone. I mean, we're almost there by wrap-up time. So, Don, I'm going to ask you just to give us your sort of one-minute wrap, your parting shots to the audience, and then I'm going to ask you, Rita, to do exactly the same. And hang around, because we're going to see both Donna and Rita next week at the Reside Conference, where we're going to be discussing student accommodation as, as one of the discussions. So, Donna, your, your, your one-minute parting shot wrap-up. Thanks, Neil. As I said with the introduction, there's a very big shortage of student accommodation in our country. And the government wants the amount of students on our campuses to increase. That shortage is not going to get smaller anytime soon. I honestly believe, and I think this is a very dynamic, and it's changing co continuously mar this market. But I still believe that if done correctly, this is a very financially it really pays well to be in this market, but you must be willing to be hands-on. You can't be totally hands-off and involve people who are better, that are better um, skilled than you are 
such as managing agents to ensure your success in this. Talk to people, get yourself educated so that you know what you're doing. That's what I suggest. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna Benzaya, and he's investor of uh, student accommodation in Bloemfontein. You'll see him next week or so if you're coming along to the Reside Summit. Rita, your final wrap. <laughs> You know, all of this sounds very overwhelming and scary sometimes. And, you know, there's so many bad stories in the news. But I got into student accommodation in 2020, which was the worst year that you can imagine to actually do that. But it has, it has, it has been so rewarding. And as long as you plan two or three things correctly from the beginning it's 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 you make really good money it's very rewarding you're dealing with with students it's a lot of fun sometimes you get gray hairs but at the end of the day i think when you're just looking at it from an investment point of view every single person that i've worked with have bought more so oh, in 2021 22 they bought their first property they they bought more it it is a bit stressful but with like I said, with the right planning, you you can get over that, um, and yeah, and whoever gets into it wants to buy, buy more. So which which just which should tell you that it is possible, and you really shouldn't be be scared to to get into it. Call me; Wonderful. I can help so you I'll to not to be audience. scared. <laughs> well, Naughty, there's really bought your book. And thank you, Nati, for buying the book. The rest of you, I also encourage you to buy Rita's book. Just the link is below in the chat box. If I could just ask my colleague uh, to, she, just to drop it in again, but it is in the chat box already. Uh, I suggest you get the book. It's probably the best 300 odd bucks that you're going to spend on a book. Uh, if not, get yourself a coach, get yourself to help uh, somebody to assist you. Um, probably be the best investment that you could ever have. Rita is running courses. She will be running courses in mid-September and uh, it will be a three-day uh, course, run over three days, a couple of hours each. So I encourage you, if you want to reach out on that, just go to info.co.za. But come along to the Reside Summit next week. Uh, that's in Johannesburg. It takes place live in Santon Convention Center. So if you're based in Joburg, uh, Tuesday, from the 16th to the 17th is InvestorCon. Our uh, Reside Conference is Wednesday and Thursday, the 18th of July. That's during the day. The InvestorCon is in the evening. And the Reside Awards takes place on Thursday evening. Uh, that's on. Uh, that's from 7 o'clock until late. And then our e Tech Conference, that's in Johannesburg on Friday. That's everything prop tech. So, um, which you'll also see real. So just by the way, you're also going to be on one of the panels there. Um, for the RE Tech Conference, uh, certainly. So from a student accommodation perspective, I know Don is also going to be there in person uh, as well. So don't miss any of that. And then, of course, um, just to say that next Tuesday, our next webinar is going to be on the 16th. It's at 7 o'clock. And we're going to be talking about funding strategies to elevate your real estate investment. So you can learn about funding strategies, what makes you are a great property investor to register. You just click on the link below, go to the rei.co.za website on the homepage. You just click on the link over there. So just for the reside event, there is a 50% discount. You just put in the code A, capital A plus, and it's REI 2024 to make your booking. We will send it through to you, to the list of people that were here today. Um, we can just drop a link. The link is already uh, in the chat box there. And to our audience, I just, uh, we appreciate always your active participation, your engagement throughout this. And we hope that you've not only gained the knowledge, but you will act on this important knowledge. That's very important. Rita has alluded to that. Donna has alluded to that. He was investor of the year 2019. Rita has written the book. She's done the training. She's helped many people. In fact, had a lot of her students shopping around in Port Elizabeth looking for properties. And uh, so being active and being proactive. So from both Donna and Rita, until next time, and myself, Neil Peterson, stay informed, stay proactive. May your ventures in the world of real estate be fruitful and fulfilling. Take care and goodbye until next week. This is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investor, along with our two esteemed panelists, Rita and Donna, signing out. We'll see you next week, guys. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, guys.